we're talking about something which is rising up the agenda in importance, uh, and by pure coincidence, um, we're going well, to be talking about uh, wearable computing devices. And by pure coincidence, this afternoon I looked in my email inbox, and what was there but an email from uh, you know, meetup.com, and it was a notification that there's a wearable technology meetup group started, starting in London. So it's something that's becoming more important. So, if we could go to the next slide. About this presentation. Okay, uh, we're going to be talking about how people use wearable computing devices to augment their physical and sensory capabilities. Uh, we'll look at uh, current developments in the field of wearable computing devices and how they can be networked together. And uh, then we'll have a little glimpse of how technology, culture, and marketing may influence the development of these new kinds of products. And why should you care? Well, fundamentally, as I said, they're becoming more important, these technologies, and I think if you understand these technologies and trends, then you'll be well placed to spot new business opportunities over the next few years. Uh, there's another reason, of course, is that it's fun. Okay, next one. And the next one. Okay, look at wearable computers now. What's a wearable computer? Uh, well, there's probably quite a few definitions of that, but you can, the conventional view is basically a comp computational and or sensory device is worn about the body. So it can be worn directly on the skin, or it can be worn over clothing, or in medical applications, medical, medical applications it can be actually implanted into the body, as we'll see. Uh, they tend to have a specialised function, but recent developments, of course, with smartphones and pocket size, iPads and so on, it's kind of beginning to blur. So, next one, please. Context of use. Mm, in what situations would you want to use something like a wearable uh, computer? Uh, well, for, for example, you could monitor physiological activity. That's just heartbeats. That's one application. You could monitor phys physical activity, such as how many steps did I take today? And you could provide sort of enhanced physical capability, such as uh, 3D reality glasses. And, incre and we increasingly will see they can be used for decorative functions. Uh, bling, for want of a better word. And also, another example would be to, in relation to uh, geographic location. So, uh, I'm here, this is my geographic location, and uh, you can use it on a digital map. Okay, okay look, quickly, we're going to have a quick look at the history of wearable devices. Uh, the idea of wearable devices to augment your personal capabilities is not new. Uh, a few examples here. Abacus beads, these were born, born in the Middle Ages by uh, some people, okay, to help them with uh, extensive counting tasks. Mechanical pocket watches, they've been around for hundreds of years, really since the 16th century, in fact. And reading glasses have been used for 800 years, in the thought of which in India or China. And um, you can probably think of lots of other examples, such as hearing aids, even shoes. Shoes, I mean, shoes are wearable devices, aren't they? Ah, the swinging 60s. So this is really the dawn of wearable computers. And the timeline for wearable computing devices really began sort of late 60s, uh, early 70s. Uh, I'll give you just a couple of examples here to give you a kind of flavor of the kind of things that went on in the 60s. Uh, there's a, a very famous musician and scientist called Manfred Kleins, and he coined the term cyborg, meaning a human whose physical or cognitive abilities were enhanced through the use of possession, the use of possession of uh, smart devices. Uh, if you've seen films like Blade Runner or Minority Report, you'll get the idea. 1961, uh, was, this was quite a famous incident where two mathematicians, uh, Edward Thorpe and Claude Shannon, they developed some small timing devices, one of which fitted in a shoe and the other fitted in a, a cigarette packet which they put in their pocket. Uh, and it's claimed that using these timing devices gave the ability to beat the dealer at rou roulette. And I think it was uh, Edward Thorpe who actually published it very, very famous book in his time, actually called Pit the Beat the Dealer. Uh, okay. uh, there's lots more interesting history we can go into, and there's a, a link there uh, on the MIT website, uh, which gives you many more examples of that, so please. The rise of the wearable computer, I don't, can you see that very well? Is that clear to you? The guy there? I can't see, he looks a bit fuzzy from where I'm sitting. Uh, this guy here, he's, he's called Steve Mann, and he's sort of very famous in uh, wearable computing circles. And he's, he's actually called the father of wearable computing. And he keeps cropping up. His name will keep cropping up uh, when you start reading about this subject. 
Uh, he's actually a professor at the uh, University of Toronto, and he's been very active in this field since the late 1970s. And he's a key thinker on wearable computers, in, particularly in relation to, to wearable computer vision systems, as you'll see in the next slide. Okay? So, again, this is Steve Mann, and this is kind of his uh, <coughs> earliest. It's not that clear, but that's from around about 1980. And you can see over a period of nearly 20 years how these, he's refined these, uh, these, this uh, vision equipment. To, so, by the late 90s, it's looking more like regular spectacles. Uh, general evolution since the 1980s. This is just some examples of what's come out of the research over the last 30 years. So, uh, multifunction digital wristwatches. You may have one yourself, you know. Uh, Head-mounted displays, which you probably don't have. Uh, wrist computers. Portable music players. Again, okay, that's something you might have. Electronic textiles. We will look at this in. Uh, we'll give you a few examples of that because that's quite interesting. Uh, how you can make high-tech fashion garments. Uh, physical and emotional well-being monitors, these are quite popular at the moment. And uh, even a necklace, which changes colour from red to blue, depending on the mood of the wearer. <laughs> Application domains, oh, pretty much anything you can think of really, it's very, very broad. Now, the military, I'll begin with the military because they've actually been very major players in research uh, into wearable technology. Uh, many <coughs> Consumer products, uh, sports equipment. Uh, for example, you can build little computers into running shoes. I think there's yeah. one man, at least one manufacturer that's done that. Yeah, despite all of this research over the years, um, commercial success has been very elusive. Uh, they, they've been mainly so far been confined to sort of niche markets. Uh, many companies have attempted to com develop commercial products for mainstream markets. Very few have had success, uh, except possibly in that list, uh, sort of Apple, of course, with iPod, and Sony with the sort of more recent generation of Walkman. Uh, but others have tried, you know, big, big companies like IBM, and they would very, very difficult mark to crack. So consumers have historically been fairly lukewarm towards the idea of wearing computer, computing devices. But I ask you, is that all about to change? Uh, I think the answer to that is, I think there are some uh, definite signs that the but it's starting to change that attitude. Uh, I think the reasons for this, I think, are, of course, smartphones and tab tablets. People have become very accustomed to using and carrying these kind of uh, devices. And, of course, the products are becoming much cheaper, better designed, and much more appealing to consumers. And to emphasize this, what the future holds, there's a market research company called ABI. And earlier this year, they published a research report which they said that by 2018 they would expect something to do with nearly half a million shipments annually of wearable computing devices. Okay. Now then, we'll look at some interesting case studies. Um, I should stress these are not endorsements or recommendations. I've selected them because they're interesting examples from which you can learn. We'll begin with, uh, I mentioned, already mentioned e-textiles. This is uh, an interesting one. Uh, this is the Loom Collection. And it's won numerous design awards over the last couple of years. And it's a good example of e-fabrics, which embed flexible electronics into the fabric. You can see what's going on here. Uh, the model has a, a smartphone app. And depending on which colour she chooses, it changes the, the colour in the collar okay, automatically. And uh, is this just a gimmick, or is it the start of something new? A new age of digital couture, is it? Phrase it. Time will tell. So let's move on to that. And this is a very famous example, which I'm, you may well be familiar with. It's uh, the Pebble smartwatch. Uh, it's famous, for probably, um, the main reason it's famous is because last year it raised more than $10 million from 70,000 investors on Kickstarter. 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 And the main reason I've included this example is because it shows that how uh, crowdfunding has been a really game changer for innovative startup companies. So that's, that's quite interesting. Uh, you get these on eBay, by the way, these days. And uh, features, I, I think they're quite limited in terms of features, personally, but uh, some people think like them. Uh, you get a range of apps uh, which are built in, which control things like fitness, 
email notification. And there's some third party apps you can get as well. And Bluetooth connectivity, uh, motion detector acceleration. So far to date, about 90,000 units have been sold. And the market is already beginning to get very competitive with Sony and Samsung have also introduced products in recent times. And there are rumours that Apple and Google will be entering the smartwatch market in the future. Okay. Okay, and now here's another interesting example. This is a, a Fitbit health monitor. And there's, uh, there's quite a few kind of uh, devices out there like that. And they, they basically tapped into an important social trend, which is uh, the desire to be healthy and fit. I must be more myself. Um, okay, so essentially what you have is you have a bracelet, which is essentially has a built-in data logger and a Bluetooth connection chip. And you can basically you can use it to, to monitor physical fitness, healthy eating, how many calories you're burning, uh, help you to manage your weight, and help you to uh, sleep better. That's, the, that's a bit of it anyway. And you can apply this data from the bracelet and you can monitor your progress via an app. Now then, the reason why I selected this one is it's an interesting example of business model innovation. So you don't just buy a piece of hardware. Uh, you buy the bracelet and along with that comes uh, access to an online service which you can register for. And that's free. And that's fairly kind of basic monitoring. But then, business model innovation is that it also has a, a premium service where you can pay, I think I remember correctly, about £40 a year. Okay, uh, and that gives you a much more enhanced kind of software application, uh, which allows you to sort of rank yourself against your peers, so you can sort of match yourself, see how well you're doing against your, your spouse or your friends or whatever. Okay, uh, one final piece of that is, this is this uh, kind of social movement called the quantified self. Has anyone heard of that? Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, the quantified self. Uh, basically, this is for people who almost obsessively uh, gather data about every, every aspect of their lives. Uh, the, the, that's the website, quantifiedself.com, and their motto is self-knowledge with numbers. Are you a practitioner? No. no. <laughs> okay, and if you're really keen, there's actually a meetup group in Brighton. Okay, and that's Fitbit. Next one. Ah, now we get on to Google Glass. Now, um, I just met quite a point. In the title of the talk, I said Google Glasses, plural. And I did that in case you had no idea what it was, then you could at least have some concept of what it might look like. But the actual name of the product is Google Glass, and that's the term I'll be using from here on. Now, what is this? Now, it's not such a clear image, but basically you have some, you have a glasses frame, okay, like that? Okay, like, like, pretty much like mine. And up here, in the top right corner of the frame, there's a small heads-up display. So you can imagine like a small heads-up display in the top corner of my glasses there. And that's essentially what they are. The hell was revolutionary, but we know different, don't we? Because um, it's really the, the product, to, it's more an evolutionary step. A lot of research has been done by people like Steve Mann and others. Uh, so it's more evolution than revolution. But even so, it's got a pretty amazing range of capabilities. It's all voice activated. And you can take a photograph, hands free. You can talk the video, hands free. Though I, it's, it's quite constrained in terms of time. I think it's about 20 second video clip. You are limited. Uh, and you can share what you see with remote friends. Yeah? So, if I, if I had Google Glass here and I had a friend sort of six miles away or whatever, they could see, they could see me looking at you. They could see exactly the same. And there have already been at least two surgical operations done that way by surgeons, by an expert remote surgeon uh, helping a not so expert surgeon cut someone open. Yeah. Well, yeah. So it has potential. Uh, it can do things like you can display root on the glass screen and you can even ask it a question and it will search for answers for you. Okay, so there's lots more information here. And it's available in some nice blingy colours. Yeah, okay. Uh, so let's, what does it look like? Well, this is an image, again, I might not be 100% clear on here. It, and it's basically a screenshot of a video from the Google website. And what you've got up here, this is an image looking out the right, right, right side uh, lens. Okay, and up here, <coughs> and the heads display, I don't see that very well, but you've got a menu, and it says, OK, glass, 
uh, take a picture, record a video, hang out with, um, things, get directions too. So, you know, so you've got essentially a small menu and a heads up display there. Uh, right. Technical specifications, um, it's based on Android, it uses voice activation, as I said. Uh, it includes built in camera and video, has Bluetooth and Wi Fi connectivity. The phone needs to support Bluetooth tethering, so in other words, you, your phone needs to be able to connect, in, in effect, proxy yeah, the data. Uh, it doesn't directly support mobile networks, where the battery app is. And it uses bone transducer audio, so the skull is used as a sound box. Now, it sounds really high tech, doesn't it? But actually, it's been around for hundreds of years <laughs> uh, in hearing aid technology. So. Well established. And uh, there are Google Glass applications called Gla Glassware, and uh, they're built by third-party developers. Uh, there's uh, lots of videos on YouTube, which are quite interesting. Next. Okay, the controversy, the Google Glass controversies. Like a lot of new technology, it's, it has its downsides. Uh, they're not entirely new, they're just a different context. So, for example, there's issues of privacy. You can be photographed and filmed without your knowledge or consent. It's very discreet. Um, Google Glass may not be legal in some countries, such as uh, Ukraine or Russia, uh, two examples. And this concern it can facilitate criminal activities. Because, of course, if you have a remote accomplice and they can see what you can see, then who knows? You know, fraud and all kinds of stuff. Uh, it can be used to display pornography good thing or not, I'll leave you judge. And there are things like issues of public safety. Should you wear them while driving? Right? Um, the usual concerns about data security. Um, there are lots more. Okay, so to sum up, Google Glass has got a lot of interesting features, but it also has its detractors. And uh, if you do a search for Google Glass criticism, you will learn many, many more. Okay, I encourage you to do a little bit of research yourself. Physical enhancements. How to go faster, stronger, smarter. Um, okay. Now, this is really where the te terminology begins to stretch a little bit. Um, a more recent term to come to the phone is wearable technology, as, a part, part, as opposed to the older expression of uh, wearable computing device. And you'll see why in this frame, why people increasingly use the phrase wearable technology. We begin with powered exoskeletons. What is that? It's a, a powered frame. It includes motors and hydraulics, and it's intended to boost human strength and endurance. Is that new? Is that new? I mean, what's a car? A car is an exoskeleton with wheels. <laughs> so it's not an entirely new concept by any means. Um, what you can see here, now, I mentioned earlier that the military are very big players in research and development, because, uh, of course, soldiers can carry more weight in combat situations. And again, this is a little bit unclear, this image here, unfortunately. But uh, this is a project, a US Army project called Future Soldier. And the guy in the, in the suit, he looks like something out of Star Wars, I'm sure you'll agree. Uh, a more practical application of exoskeletons is in medicine, um, particularly um, one very fruitful area of research is helping people who have severe spinal injuries so they can't walk, they're paralyzed. You know. uh, what they can do is they can strap on an exoskeleton, hey presto, they can walk. Okay. Right, smart prosthetics, artificial limbs. There's been huge strides made in this over the last decade. Um, unfortunately, it's been on the back of a lot of military personnel losing limbs in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, so there's been progress has been made at a quite significant human cost, but uh, it's quite amazing um, the kind of prosthetics what you can get now. And they typically a lot of them have like onboard micro controllers and software, and sensors that can detect force and movement, acceleration. Uh, there are even some smart limbs, if you can get. You can actually sense the user's environment and predict how a user may behave in those circumstances. A uh, couple of examples here. There's one here, again, it's a not 100% clear image, is uh, a bionic hand. Okay, now this is, um, this is the result of an EU re research part, an EU research project called Smart Hand Project, appropriately. And uh, this is pretty amazing. 
because it provides the user with tactile feedback. So someone might not have lost their hand 20 years ago, they can put one of these on, they can pick up an orange or a ball or something, and they can actually feel it, which is pretty amazing if you think about it. Uh, other developments, there are many, but I'll give you one other, is there are innovations in monitoring, uh, monitoring the status of the prosthetic, because they can be a little bit troublesome. Uh, so physicians like to monitor them, monitor them. And uh, you, can get, you can actually monitor them via mobile apps these days. And that's uh, an example from a company called Orthocare Invention Innovations. Okay. Thanks. Flexible electronic circuits. Mm, these are not a new idea. If you were to take apart a camera, even probably one of these cameras, uh, I can pretty much guarantee you that they contain very flexible electronic circuitry, so you can pack in as much electronics as you can in the available space. Um, but what's different now is uh, they can now make these circuits really small and ultra-thin, like, for example, the photo on the right. Um, lot, again, lots of applications. You can weave these into fabrics. So, you could, for example, uh, you could design a jacket that effectively is, you know, functions as a harpy monitor. Uh, they can be implanted into the body, and they can be wrapped around limbs. So there are a lot of potential applications here, but it's still early date here, this technology. Okay, now this is science fiction. <laughs> this is science fiction. This is e-skin, or bionic skin. Uh, there's a number of research groups around the world who are sort of active in this field. Um, again, I don't know if this is slightly in a clear picture from where I stood, but again, it's like a patch which is placed on the skin, and it's an incredibly thin uh, circuit. And uh, this is one example from the eSkin project in Switzerland. And their, their avowed aim is to develop a novel type of wearable interface which mimics the sensory capabilities of the human skin. So, it's a very ambitious goal, very ambitious goal. But potentially it's got all kinds of medical and cosmetic applications, maybe perhaps you know, plastic surgery, Okay, next one. Still, we'll stick with e-skin. One more example. I think this is amazing. This is, amazing. This is a, a recent innovation by um, Berkeley University in the United States. And what they've got is a flexible e-skin which lights up when it's touched. <laughs> this is pretty amazing. Okay. You just touch the thing and it lights up. Uh, applications include robotics and medicine. And the question I ask myself is, could it be transformed into wearable bling? Answer that one, it's almost certainly yes. So, next. Okay, next we're going to look. Um, so far, we've looked at these devices in isolation. Um, at this point, we're going to look how you can connect these devices in such a way they can communicate with each other and interact with services on the internet. Uh, also, what are the possible consequences of doing this? And um, the rest of these slides are going to look at this in this section. Personal networks, I'm sure you're all familiar with this idea. Um, essentially, the personal net networks would operate within a very constrained radius, maybe 10 meters or something, typically confined to your office or your home. Um, and you can connect all these up. Typically, you can get all kinds of things up, up, such as phones, tablets, PDAs, computers, wearable devices, uh, presumably Google Glass and <laughs> things like that. And communication occurs between participating devices or connected resources on the internet via local outlink connection. Okay. Which could be fixed on mobile, of course. Now, these employ short range, low, pa low power wireless technologies such as infrared and, and Bluetooth. There are others such as ZP and XP, uh, which are used more in home automation, for example. Uh, and body area nets, we're going to talk about in a moment. Geeks only, and that's the relevant IEEE standard, uh, which I'm sure you may well be familiar with, 8215 standards. Uh, right, okay, so as I'm, I think I touched on, uh, wearable computing devices, you can potentially communicate with other computing devices that are worn about the person, or with services on the internet. Uh, again, go if you do a Google image search for personal area networks, it'll provide a lot of inspiration. Next one. Now, wireless body area networks. This is really kind of interesting. Uh, you can consider this as a special case of a wireless personal area network. Uh, it it utilises only devices which are attached or in very close proximity to 
the body. And you can use uh, one of those pan technologies, particularly Bluetooth for this graph. Uh, again, you, you can connect to the service on the internet via a local gateway router. Uh, the main application is currently in medicine, whereby a patient will wear sensors to monitor breathing or heart rate or whatever. And, uh, and the sensors may be implanted into the body internally. And monitoring can be performed either locally or remotely via the internet. That's effectively telemedicine. Okay. Uh, Geeks only again. That's the relevant IEEE standard. Next one. Now, this is, uh, again, wireless body area networks. Uh, this is just a snapshot. I did a Google image search on wireless area body networks. Uh, you get an amazing array of graphics. Uh, pretty much most of them are devoted to medicine. Um, but that will give you some idea of the kind of range of medical applications that it's useful. Okay, next one. Another one is intrabody communications. Now then, you're probably familiar, I'm sure you are, <laughs> with the idea that the human body is a, a quite a good conductor of electricity. I mean, if you've got an electric shock, you all know this for sure. Uh, you can actually exploit that fact to use it to use the human body or, or more correctly the skin as a, a communications medium. Uh, in this case, for example, you could have a, a device strapped on the left arm, a device strapped on the right arm, and they can communicate with each other using the body. Okay? Uh, so again, devices attached to the body, they can communicate via ultra low voltage signals. And also another way you can do this is the human body also, yeah, it's like a capacitor, it can still charge. Uh, you're pr probably familiar with the idea of uh, RFIDs, you know, you scan packages in the supermarket. Again, at a distance, okay. it's a similar kind of principle. Uh, in this example, uh, you've got a guy, he's walking up to a door, and he's wearing a device which identifies him as a, a valid user you know, who's allowed to enter the building. But before he's even touched the handle, when he gets about half a metre away, the the access control system has already decided whether or not to let him in. Yeah. Okay. Next one, please. Near me networks. Mm. Oh, I don't like this term personally, but um, essentially this is geographically this is relevant to a specific geographic location. Uh, it's, a, it's really a logical network. Um, and it, it really uh, uses the fact that the people you're trying to target are in roughly the same vicinity, like a radius of half a mile or whatever, and you, you're forget, you can get these services on smartphones, GPS enabled smartphones, for example. And uh, a, a somewhat contrived example here is I'm planning to hold a party in my place on Saturday night, and I use a service to invite everybody in my neighbourhood, say within half a mile or whatever. Um, that's via a near, near me network, or, or I've lost my cat and I want all my neighbours search my cat or something. Flight like control example. We get the other Okay, next one please. Internet of Things. Oh, huge subject. Um, another one that's rising out the agenda. Uh, there's a lot of uh, the problems of how you define it, so I'll stick with the OED definition. It's a proposed development of the internet in which everyday objects have network connectivity, allowing them to send and receive data. Okay, simply put, Everything is connected. So you could conceivably connect any type of electronic device or sensor to the internet. Uh, and this could certainly include the kind of uh, products and technologies that we'll be looking at here this evening. Uh, now, that being the case, the internet will consist literally of billions of connected devices, or the device cloud as it's often known. Uh, huge, like I say, huge growing subject, but we haven't got time to really go into any detail there. Uh, Interesting subject for another talk. Okay. Internet of Bling. Okay. This is a bit of fun. This is serious. Uh, but it does have a serious side to it, I can show you. So, we know that technology is used uh, in kind of social contexts to create social contact, uh, social status. You can use to foster individual identity and influence social interactions with other people. A good example is, for example, widespread adoption of mobile phones, smartphones, social media. That's had a huge impact on people's lives. Uh, so I asked myself the question, what effect, what would be the impact of the mass adoption of 
low cost wearable computing devices connected by the Internet of Things, what kind of cultural and social changes would that trigger? Um, so I came up with this scenario called the Internet of Things, very tongue in cheek, but uh, it's, uh, there is some truth to it, as you will see. <laughs> uh, this is a scenario that shows the interplay between technology, culture, and the power of marketing. Okay, so the next one. Oh, that's not a bird. That hasn't displayed very well, unfortunately. Basically, this is another image of a, a woman wearing a dress. I don't know if you can see it looking back there. It's a woman wearing a dress with another one of these uh, bling kind of touches. It's kind of a sash, which is green. Um, so we already looked at loom connections. So here's another example to show that it's not just a one-off thing. You know. uh, will it ever become mainstream? You know, will people be walking down the street with uh, kind of electronic clothes? Time will tell. Time will tell. Next one. Uh, where are all electronic jewellery? This is another kind of interesting idea. Uh, in this one, we uh, electronic pen a pendant, uh, and it produces beautiful LCD patterns on the screen. Uh, these patterns, are, if you've ever played like the game of life, you know, these are called cellular automata. You know, where you have a little light appear on the grid, and then you have another light, and they appear. They kind of multiply, and you get uh, amazing patterns. So that's essentially what that one does. Um, that's what a company called Lucy um, But would you wear one of these? Would you buy one as a gift? <laughs> uh, next, please. Digital headwear. Ah, right, this is interesting. Uh, now, this is a company called Adafruit, which is really, uh, really interesting company. It's actually a spin-off from MIT in the States. Uh, it's founded by this uh, lady here called Lim Free. Okay. Uh, very interesting person. And um, essentially, they're not afraid to use the word bling in connection with these. If they do, they do talk about bling. They're quite uh, happy to talk about it. And I don't, again, I don't think you can see that very clearly, but you've got two models here, and they're wearing these kind of headsets, and they switch, the lights switch on and off in sequence. Uh, so they produce, it, and these are actually called space face headwear. And they produce earrings as well, things like that. It's, uh, it's a, a very interesting electronics website. Like no electronics website you've ever seen before, it has a definite feminine sensibility about it. Perhaps. Well worth we'll visiting. Okay, now some fun. Okay, so I asked myself, where does all this thing lead to? Uh, I thought to myself, well, what would it be like if we went for 10 years? And so I thought about uh, the, the sort of benchmark for these kind of uh, fashion and beauty kind of things is uh, the Glossy Women's Magazine. So I thought, came, I came up with one called Pogue. Uh, apologies for Shane McGowan. And uh, I thought, what would the cover look like? And, uh, and here you have a model sporting e-skin and some gossipy stuff. Uh, so I asked myself, what would the best dressed models be wearing in 2025? Well, e-skin could be a must-skin, a must-have accessory. Clothes made from these textiles, digital jewellery could be all the rage, and wearable computing devices of all kinds could be common, very commonplace. And all of these things could conceivably be connected to the Internet of Things in some way. Uh, that's his fantasy, isn't it? But who can predict how this will uh, play out in the future? Because you have this whole interplay of technology and culture, and you should never underestimate the power of marketing. So. This is fancy, but who knows? Give it another 10 years, might not be. Okay, just some final thoughts and conclusions. Okay, next one. Challenges ahead. Oh, there's some really major challenges uh, to implement, implementing this device cloud of wearable, personal, and mobile devices. Uh, lots of technical problems. Uh, I didn't know what the audio was going to like tonight, so I haven't gone into this in detail. But one obvious one would be. Well, uh, need to roll out uh, IP version 6, yeah, big time. Currently, according to RIPE, that's the European Internet Registry, uh, only about 2.5% of traffic on the internet is currently IP version 6. So that hasn't really changed very much over the last two years, despite IP version 6 days. Um, energy, okay, so you, you've got all of these millions of devices, and collectively, they could consume an awful lot of energy. So they need to be designed to ultra-low power.
security, there are the usual kind of headaches. Um, so how do you secure your, your wearable computing devices, for example, your, your bling jacket or whatever, from theft, hacking, malware, viruses? Yeah. Um, privacy, we've already touched on this in relation to uh, Google Glass, uh, again. But looking at uh, in the, uh, the broader context, there would be services, certainly, that would want to harvest your data from all of your uh, wearable mobile devices. So, who controls this data? Who owns it? Uh, this is uh, quite controversial in the light of all these revelations about NSA spying and so on. Uh, the, the last challenge is sustainability. This is something that's frequently pushed to one side, uh, but I'm not going to do that. So, what happens to all the millions of devices that are going to be produced? Are they all going to be shoved in the landfill? Well, there is a, a design discipline called Design for Environment, which is fairly mature now. And, um, at the time of these practices were taken seriously. So, for example, you design for assembly, design for disassembly, uh, recycling materials at the end. And so you're trying to minimise the overall life cycle of these devices. And there's going to be millions of them, so I think that's something that uh, needs to be taken seriously. Next one, just conclusions. Right, I think, uh, having looked at this issue in some detail, my, I think my opinion is we're probably on the cusp of the next wave of digital innovation, uh, centred around, by, around wearable mobile devices. Now, the mobile devices part of it, I think, is fairly advanced, and I think the next, uh, the next part of the wave will be uh, wearable computing devices. Um, and other forms of wearable technology. So... Point number two, we've looked at some interesting case studies. Uh, we've seen how crowdfunding, business model innovation, uh, new technologies and the involvement of uh, big players like Google, these have really helped galvanise things and uh, made uh, wearable computers and the Internet of Things a tangible reality. Uh, we've also had a bit of fun and looked at this Internet of Bling, it's a plausible scenario, of how technology can shape culture and vice versa aided by the power of marketing. And the fourth conclusion I would come to is, uh, I have come to, is when wearable computing devices become more integrated with social media, in the same way smartphones and tablets, I think things could start to get really interesting. Okay. One final intriguing slide. One final. Just one final. Next one. <laughs> this is, this is uh, kind of interesting. Uh, I, I was thinking about this. Uh, you kind of, you're probably familiar with this one. This is uh, Apple. Uh, it's a famous advert a few years back for advertising the iPod, and that's digital age culture. Now this, I probably, you probably haven't seen before, it's uh, cave painting in Tanzania. And that's stone age culture. And they're both, they're kind of both partying, and uh, they both look equally primal, and yet they're separated by about 30,000 years. And I thought, well, it's a very interesting comparison to put them side by side. And you could almost unplug the earphones from there and give them to this guy there. So it's a kind of interesting comparison. Uh, I thought, well, what's the connection between them? Does anything connect them? And I think, again, they're both kind of products of technology and culture at times. And the lesson you can draw from that is, I think, that you can use uh, scenarios like the Internet of Glee uh, to try and map out possible pathways of how this could develop uh, when uh, wearable computing devices and the Internet of uh, internet Things become more commonplace. Okay, done. Thank you. Any questions? No? Well, it's, it is a subject that has more questions than answers. I'll tell you that much. So where, um, <clears throat> what do you think is going to be the main driver behind wearable tech in the near future? Is it going to be medical? There's so many applications. Uh, I think medical is certainly one of the main drivers, yeah. Uh, me I say medical, military, consumer devices, they need to produce uh, attractive consumer devices. Uh, I think Fitbit would be uh, one like that. And uh, I think uh, the smartwatches, they're trying to really push smartwatches. Has anyone got a smartwatch? Yeah, Mark, who is, uh, could be here tonight, he's got a Pebble and a Fitbit on the same wrist. 
Yeah, I don't think that makes any difference. No, but, it's, um, like it's like a shopping list. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the people I know, <laughs> the people I know with with Fitbits and related, you know, other versions by the manufacturers do seem to get really obsessed by them. Uh, probably in a good way, in that it does try and make them want to exercise more. So I think Mark was saying he, yeah, he, he and his wife have go, both got them, people. and now they've been now they've got competitive about who walks the most each day to try and outdo each other. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I suppose that's in a way, although it's it's kind of medical tech and consumer at the same time. Yeah, I think the, the biggest potential growth I think is in consumer because, like I said, the cost of the device is falling, the design is getting better, and they're becoming more. Uh, there's more kind of business model innovation, so you're not just buying a, a piece of hardware, you're actually buying into a software application as well. And uh, I think, if, like I say, if they became more integrated with social media, those kind of applications, it could be quite interesting. You might even see maybe the rise of uh, dedicated social media platforms that integrate all these different things together, maybe. It's possible. Well, uh, I was going to share the story on the best security story I heard was about Dick Cheney, he was a pacemaker. Oh, right, and yeah. And he asked, during the Gulf War, he had the Wi-Fi taken off because oh, right. it was, he was worried about hacking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. They could actually hack his pacemaker. You can, yeah. Which yeah. was an average story. Yeah, that, yeah. yeah. And, and there was a put all that together. Yeah. It's yeah, there is security. There's a lot of security problems and everything. Yeah, and there's, um, I mean, there's a lot of news around Google Glass every day. I was reading the other day about the latest firmware release. It was a pretty amazing stuff. Well, have I actually available to buy now? Um, my understanding, in the States, they had kind of like a beta program, and you could buy one for $1,500. Uh, some people have taken theirs back. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of mixed reviews. You know. um, but I think they're going to be released um, more widely available next year, in 2014. So because what's the sort of battery life on them? Not long, about four hours. Four four hours. hours yeah. I mean, and that's without any kind of, that's why they haven't put any kind of mobile. Well, yeah, you saw the slide. So you got the first one, don't you? Good feedback. You saw the slide with the Steve Mann, and how he went from like the early 1980s to the late 1990s. And that took nearly 20 years to evolve that. So, mm -hmm. uh, Google Glass. Uh, Mark two might be interesting. Yeah. Yeah, there's supposed to be results of that, so not enough money behind it. Oh, absolutely, work. absolutely. They can certainly yeah. do that. Yeah. I suppose with, the thing is, with the clothing, though, if you put electronic things in clothing, how do you clean it? Oh, that's, that's, a, that's, a, yeah. that's an interesting... I had a thought about that. Um, you could put it in the washing machine, could you? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know. 40 it's, cycle. It's it can't be the worst. You might have special detergents, maybe, or some special wash cycle. Maybe you have to dry clean them. Probably not the best. Quite, quite interested in that. Yeah. But like I say, the, the loom collections have been very popular. Yeah, I suppose you just need some lovely tool effect on the latest yeah. This, this is it. You, you need, and it will just go whoosh, won't it? You need somebody prominent on. to start turn up at some uh, gala dinner or mm. something or some film premiere wearing this kind of electronic bling, and everyone will want one. Mm. Yeah. Well, that, I think that's. That's what stands out for me is a lot of the examples you've cited are all about choice, they're consumer choice, or there's, there's, yeah. there's a purpose in it. But I think it's, it's going to get to the point where they're imposed on us that's going to change things, for me anyway. So What's going to be imposed? Well, smart meters is the next oh, yes, going yes. to be point that's when they the try them in the UK. When they start putting this in cars and it's a black box that's measuring everything, mm -hmm. and then it, it weighs against the advantages the consumer get, you, you know, you get from your running app telling you how much your heart is yeah. eating, how many calories, to a point where you know, it's more of a, there's a change in, in the But balance. you're free to innovate. The whole lot is stored in the cloud, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. monitored by whoever wants to monitor it. Yeah, yeah, the, 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 yeah there are a lot of concerns, very justified. Oh, you can sort of step away from that. What, do you know the, uh, mentioned about the legal ramifications in some other countries. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, I think uh, places like Ukraine and Russia, they're you know, a bit sort of paranoid. Uh, that they'll have spies and so on. Kind of spy on them. 
probably China as well. I mean, there's quite a few, probably quite a few countries, but uh, you would not be welcome with your Google Glass. <laughs> You're fine in Russia if it's mounted in your car. Uh, they've got the car dashboard cams are quite popular. Oh yeah, they are, they? Yeah, yeah. That um, big meter, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, really brought it up. So. Uh, do you think um, there seems to have been some form of wearable tech around for a very long time? Not yeah, just been, Steve yeah. Mann, but other people yeah. experimenting. Well, I mean, wearable tech is, like I say, not new, it's as old as the hills. Uh, it's really the kind of the electronic wearable tech that's really, that really started to kick off sort of late 50s, early 60s. Uh, it's really accelerated since uh, sort of 80s, and I'll give you some examples. Yeah. So is it, um, part, is it hitting the big time now partly because I don't know, mobile, the popularity of mobile phones has meant there's been a lot of miniaturisation? Yeah, I mean, people are more used to the idea of having portable devices. Uh, and. Uh, I think Fitbit's been fairly successful in, in that particular market. I mean, it's not the only by any means. No, it's like Nike have got their yeah, 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 band. Yeah, I mean, like so the thing is, it's the big names and Google bringing in that's kind of legitimising it. Exactly. It's exactly. an area now. Exactly. Yeah. 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 When the big players, really big players come into it, then you know, people take it and sit and, sit and take notice. Yeah.